Hi there. I'm Randy of Madrona Labs, and I'm here to show you some of the features of the new SoundPlane client software version 0.99 that I just released. This is a very quick, unscripted screencast made to get the information out to you as quickly as possible. So without further ado, um, I'm going to dive in and walk you through getting started with this new software. So the first thing is you've downloaded this, and you can get that from the forums on madronalabs.com. Unzip the file to get the SoundPlane app. But first, you want to trash your old preferences. So we're going to look for a file called SoundPlane app state dot text and just trash that. It appears that I have two of them because I'm developing stuff on my computer and that's in the mail attachments folder. So I'm going to go to the one that I know where it is. Soundplane app state.txt. You're going to find that in application support Madrona Labs. Uh, it's going to be installed automatically for you when the new client runs, but right now we just get rid of that. So the preferences are gone, we can launch the new client. Get rid of this boring finder window and bring over the interesting sound plane window. Um, so because you've trashed the prefs, all of these dials are set up to their default values. And it, we can see it's found sound plane serial number 40. And it's come up with apparently some okay defaults already for calibration, but we're going to make those better. Um, this is a copy of Alto running in Apple's AU lab. And you can see when you launch the sound plane client, it notes that the um, sound plane is sending it data over OSC. So this T3D connected light goes on. Uh, and you're sending continuous data over OSC. Um, so I'm going to go to the expert page right now because this being the first launch of the software, we should select what carrier frequencies to use on the sound plane. And this is a completely hands-off sort of process. When you click it, it tests a bunch of pre-wrapped, pre-made sets of carriers, figures out which one has the lowest noise, and then calibrates that one. And um, all these decisions are saved when you quit the client application back in that SoundPlane app state file. So that being done, we've got a nice clean set of carrier frequencies. You can see if you turn the view scale up to five, that's five times the noise that's coming out of it. And there's not very much. It's quite flat. So now we can calibrate the tracker. And that takes a little hands-on action and is basically the reason for this video. So, hello and welcome to calibration. While that's printing out, you don't touch the sound plane surface. And then what you do is slide around um, one finger on the surface with a light touch to give the calibration software an indication of what a touch looks like and how heavy it is at different positions on the surface. So, I'm going to pan down by folding my laptop a little here so you can see the sound plane in my lap. Actually this is not the best place to calibrate it. You really would like to do this on a flat surface but uh, this should work and is good enough. So if you can calibrate on a flat surface. Now I'm just running across this and showing you basically what happens. I'm using a light touch here. It's a little hard to see my display because it's halfway folded down. But this is the idea. You run over all of the little squares. Each one of these represents one sensor junction inside the sound plane. So that's why there's such a fine grid. And then just keep running them over all of them. And they turn green when you've gone, off, gone over them twice, which is what you need to do. So I'm going to fold this up um, so I can look at it myself a little better. And just continue going over it. You don't need to be super scientific about keeping the touch constant, but just kind of make a light even touch. Now, 
Um, this takes a little while, but it's not something you should have to do more than once. Or if your sound plane maybe went through some kind of environmental change, like if it's acting funny, you could try doing this, but in normal operation, um, you shouldn't have to do it repeatedly. So that done, it goes into normal operation mode, and this will be auto-saved when you quit out. So I can take a look now at what touches I get from the sound plane. And you should be able to hear alto in the background there. And if we look at one touch, you get a very nice graph of, of course, force over time. And you can see that you have a very wide range of pressures that are sensed. Uh, it looks even better if you have filtering up to something above 100. So you can see there's a whole lot of data to work with there, way more than a traditional musical sensor gives you, like a MIDI keyboard. Um, and so I guess that calibration being done, I can walk through some of the other features I've added recently. This is a good time to do that. Um, the low pass now works on the filtered data, which is much more predictable. And so what that does is gives very, very static, predictable shapes to the touch data. So if you wanted to do something, a performance where you weren't interested in quick motion, but you wanted your slow motion to be very stable, this would be a good way to do it. You can see here we can rock through the pressures of each one of these voices, get very nice data out. But for quick playing, something on the order of 100 hertz is a better selection. Um, other thing that's very interesting is this new XY view mode. So this shows you, um, first of all, the gray and white background picture is actually the sensor data overlaid on the grid of keys. So you can really see what data the sound plane is putting out very directly. And you can see why it might be hard to write a touch tracker that actually detected the difference in these touches because the blobs of data are quite near each other. So that's a process that I'm still working on, but this calibration is a really big step forward for it. Um, so you can see all the shapes you can make over time, etc. You can see the history of each trace um, drawn out on the XY grid. And Going over to the expert page, oh, on the next page here, there's um, the zone map stuff, which is yet to be done, but there's a, a pressure selector for MIDI. Now, MIDI velocity works really well now, um, since this calibration code is in. Um, and this pressure here is not for velocity. What the pressure um, so you've got MIDI active, let's say we're sending touches to a Logic Piano or something. Pressure means that continuous data, the curves, are sent over continuous control pressure um, to each um, MIDI channel all the time at, at this rate, which would be 250 hertz. That's a lot for a lot of uh, applications to deal with, and they can choke on that data unless you've got it set up carefully. So. If you're just interested in sort of playing a MIDI synthesizer with attack velocity, uh, with note on velocity, you just turn pressure off so it's not sending the continuous data. I'm going to turn OSC back on to get data back into Alto. Um, and here we have a background filter, which you probably want to leave at the standard value. It's kind of carefully tuned to um, for touches to inhibit other ones when you are um, in normal operation. But um, yeah, if you want to, if you're interested in, you know, for example, playing your sound plane like this more often, which is possible now um, and doesn't give you false touches when you move it around, uh, thanks to the new calibration code, you might want to tweak the background filter to a special value. So uh, ask me about it on the forums. Hysteresis is what prevents glitching when you move from one key to another. So if I have hysteresis all up at one here, it's very hard to move 
Oh, I've got a continuous pitch X, that's why. Because I'm trying to move in Y. Okay. So with history sys at 1, if I put my finger down on a key, it waits until I'm significantly into the next key, halfway in, before it changes to this other note. And now when I move back, again, it takes half of the key's distance before I change to the next note. And that prevents a glitching that happens um, when you're on the border between notes. Um, usually 0.5 is a good value for hysteresis. And finally, the template value is not something to be messed with probably. It's set automatically by the calibration software. And it, um, the lower this template value is, the more picky the touch sensor is about what constitutes a touch. So if you were having problems with some touches dropping out, let's say you wanted to maybe play it with a baseball and with uh, your finger at the same time, for some reason, you might want to turn template up to a higher value. Um, so that's it. That's all for this. It got a little long-winded, but not too bad, I hope. And I hope you're enjoying using your sound planes more with the new calibration software. Stay tuned for more developments.